everyone. Welcome to part two of chapter four. Last time we got an introduction to calculations in chemistry by talking about the fact that all numbers in chemistry always have to have a unit. And typically in chemistry, we are measuring things, right? Like we're using a ruler or a balance or a graduated cylinder and we're making a measurement. And we talked about the fact that in that measurement, there's some error that can happen, right? There's some uncertainty that can happen with this measurement because no tool can measure to an infinite amount of decimal places. So then we started talking about significant figures and how many digits can we actually report in a measurement or after we do calculations, right? Addition and subtraction or multiplication and division. So that's where we kind of left off last time. Today, we're going to start talking about the metric system. And the metric system is different from the English system that we are typically used to. So we need to talk about the metric system and all of those prefixes that go with it. In addition, today we are going to focus on our units of measurement, like grams and liters, right? And those are part of the metric system. And we're going to learn how to do conversions with those units. The conversion process that we're going to use is called dimensional analysis. And that's going to be really the focus of today's lecture and learning how to do these calculations in a straightforward manner. So let's go ahead and get going. All right, so like I said, the system of measurement that we use in chemistry is called the metric system. Um, and the metric system is actually used in most of the world. The English system that we use here, right, whether it's feet or pounds, right, all of that is the English system. And pretty much nowhere else in the world uses those units of measurement. It's really just the United States. Um, the rest of the world uses the metric system. Like, so let's say you were traveling in Europe for the summer all of their temperatures would be reported in degrees Celsius, and all of the distances would be reported in kilometers, right? And so these are things that in general in the United States we're kind of unfamiliar with. So we're going to learn them because chemistry is an international language. And so we use all of these units of measurement that the rest of the world unit uses so that we can, you know, talk to the rest of the world. So we will be using the metric system. And more specifically, we actually use the SI system, but they're so similar that in this class, we're just gonna to refer to this as the metric system. But the metric system is a standard system of measurements for mass, length, time, and other physical quantities. Um, so what we have in the metric system is we have these base units, like mass is, or sorry, length is in meters, um, our mass is in kilograms, our temperature is in Kelvin, and then our time is in seconds. And we will use prefixes to kind of modify these base units to make them bigger or smaller. Um, and this actually works, um, you know, a lot easier for, you know, from a mathematical perspective, because we're going to multiply and divide by powers of 10. So here's what I mean by that. So here's our base units. So, you know, meters, liters, grams, and seconds. Those are going to be our base units. And I'll say them again in case you're not familiar. Meters, liters, grams, and seconds. So those are our base units. And we will use prefixes to make those units bigger or smaller. Like, you might be familiar with kilometer, right? A, you know, so the abbreviation would be KM. And, or you could think about it as being a kilometer, right? And so when we talk about kilometers, we're usually talking about them kind of like we talk about miles. This would be a, a large distance, right? That maybe you're driving in your car. Um, and a kilometer is a thousand meters. That prefix kilo is telling us that it's a thousand. So kilometers literally means 1000 meters, which is kind of cool, right? Um, let's take another one. So another one you might be familiar with is maybe milliliters. We measure volumes in chemistry in milliliters. We use our graduated cylinder and we'll measure out some number of milliliters. So a liter, um, or more specifically, you might be familiar with like a two liter. Like if you went to the store and you bought a two liter of soda, um, milliliters are much smaller. They're like I said, what we use to measure volumes in our chemistry labs. So in a milliliter, there are 1,000 milliliters, right, in one liter. Or like here, there's 1,000 milliseconds 
in one second. So milli means very, very small. So everything down here, all of these prefixes are making your unit smaller. And all of these prefixes are making your unit bigger. Okay, and you'll notice though, um, they're all moving by a power of 10. So you're not having to remember these conversions like there's 12 inches in a foot or three feet in a yard. <clears throat> these are all going by powers of 10. And you just need to remember how many zeros you have in that conversion. So in this class, these are the units that I would like you to know. Specifically, the ones, and I'm gonna block them off, from here to here. So from kilo to milli, those are the ones I want you to focus on in this class. So kilo is very large. So like I said, one kilometer has a thousand meters. So we have kilo, hecto, deca, and then our base units, and then deci, centi, and milli. Okay, so I want you to remember those. And again, they're going by powers of 10. So we go 1,000, 100, 10, then our base unit, and then smaller, right? 10, 100, 1,000. The way that I would like you to remember this is King Henry died unusually drinking chocolate milk, okay? And you know by now that I tell you a lot of silly things to help you remember some of the um, trickier kind of topics in this class. So this will help you with the order of the prefixes. King is kilo, he Henry is hecto, died is deca, unusually is our base unit, right? So that stands for unit, and then drinking is deci, chocolate is centi, and then milk is milli. So you can remember the order of these prefixes by remembering King Henry died unusually drinking chocolate milk. And if you're going, you know, this way, your units are getting bigger, that way your units are getting smaller, okay? And again, this is our base unit here. So this would be like meters, liters, grams, and seconds. So that little mnemonic will help you remember the order of these units. All right, so let's focus on some of these units uh, more specifically. So the measurement of length that we typically use in the metric system is a meter. You might be familiar with a yardstick, right? It's fairly long kind of piece of wood we use to measure things. In chemistry, we actually use a meter stick. Um, so a lot of people will use those interchangeably. They're actually different. A meter stick and a yardstick are not the same. Um, a meter stick is exactly one meter long. Uh, or 100 centimeters long. But our meter is our standard unit of length in the metric system. So here's some common length relationships. So one meter is 1,000 centimeters, okay? And like I said, if you've used a meter stick before, you may know that already. There are 100 centimeters in a meter. And this prefix centi should remind you of cents in a dollar, right? Like there are 100 cents in a dollar, so that's how we can remember there are 100 cents in a centimeter, right? Or a 100 centimeters, my apologies, in a meter. That centi prefix is telling us there are 100 of something in that unit. And then milli, kind of like we were talking about milliliters, millimeters works the same way because it has that same prefix milli. Millimeters are much smaller. There are 1,000 millimeters in a meter, okay? And then like I said, kilometers are very, very, very long. They're like we used to measure um, distances that we would travel in a car. So are, there are 1,000, you know, meter sticks, essentially, in one kilometer. So these are some common length relationships. You don't need to memorize these separately, though, because you're memorizing the prefixes anyway. So these are just kind of helpful for you to know. But if you know the prefixes, you know them. So this one, though, is how we get between the metric system and the English system, which is what we use. Okay, so we usually measure things in inches, right? And to convert between inches to centimeters or vice versa, we'll use one inch is equal to 2.54 centimeters. So if we were working in our English system, that would allow us to convert into our metric system or vice versa. I wanna be clear, you do not need to memorize this. I will always give this one to you. The only ones I want you to know are those prefixes from the previous slide um, that will help you convert between the metric system. But anytime we're going from metric to English or the other way around, I will give you that conversion. All right, so as we talk about these units in this lecture, I'm also going to talk about dimensional analysis. Okay, so dimensional analysis is this problem-solving method that we are going to use a ton in this class. 
I will actually usually call them train tracks just because it's shorter than saying dimensional analysis over and over and over again. And it sounds maybe a little bit more friendly, um, but it's a way of solving these problems that can be laid out really clearly and allow you to see how the units cancel and make sure you're always getting the right answer. So I wanna be really clear though, this dimensional analysis problem solving method is not gonna be used just in this chapter. We are going to use it in the entire course. So make sure you're really understanding how this you know, train track system works so that you can use it properly and feel really confident doing the math in this class. Remember, my whole goal is to make chemistry as easy as possible for you because it can be a challenging subject. So embrace this whole dimensional analysis method and let me know if you have any questions on how to use it because it really does lay it out really clearly. Um, so the reason that we're doing this is that many chemical principles and problems are illustrated mathematically. You probably have heard that in this class there's a fair bit of math and it's true. We do a lot of math in this class. Um, but a lot of it can be done through dimensional analysis. So if we learn this one problem solving method and apply it to a bunch of different topics, it actually makes it that much easier. So dimensional analysis is a systematic method to solve different types of numerical problems in chemistry. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and learn how to use that. So the whole premise of dimensional analysis is that it converts one unit of measure to another using conversion factors. You're gonna hear me talk a lot about conversion factors today. And those were conversion factors that we saw earlier, like one kilometer equals a thousand meters or 100 centimeters equals one meter. When things are equal like that, we call them conversion factors. And we can use them in our dimensional analysis to allow us to solve problems, okay? So a conversion factor is a fraction where the same quantity is expressed one way in the numerator and another way in the denominator. And I'll show you what that looks like. So here's an example of quality. One kilometer equals a thousand meters. We've talked about that one a couple times now. To use it as a conversion factor, we change it into a fraction where one half of it will go on the top and the other half will go on the bottom like this. In this one, the one kilometer went on the top and the thousand meters went on the bottom. So I like to say when things are equal, they get stacked, right? So when these two things are equal, they're going to get stacked in this fraction. But it doesn't matter which one you put on the top or bottom, right? Here we have the thousand meters on the top and one kilometer on the bottom. The way we know which one to put on the top or the bottom will depend on what is in the previous slot before it in dimensional analysis. But the important thing here is that when things are equal, they're going to get stacked one way or the other. Um, and then we're going to end up kind of multiplying and dividing some numbers in order to get our final answer. Okay, so let's see this. So our example is to convert 400 meters into kilometers. Anytime we have a problem like this, where there's some math that needs to happen, we need to figure out what we're starting with. And here in these types of problems, it's always going to be the thing with the number, right? We're starting with 400 meters and that is going to go in the beginning of our train track. Okay, so whatever number we're starting with, that number and its unit will go in the beginning of our train track. Okay, so here's what my little train track looks like. So you can see the 400 meters went in the top left. That's always where we're gonna start. In this class here is always gonna be left blank. So you don't need to put anything there ever. In higher levels of chemistry, you may put things there, but not in this class. We're just gonna leave that blank. So now we're gonna convert 400 meters into kilometers. To do this, we need an equality that allows us to go from meters to kilometers. So we learned that on the previous page, right? We learned 1000 meters equals one kilometer. Okay, that was the conversion, right? You can see we have meters here and meters here and kilometers here and kilometers here. So this equality uses the two units that we need, okay? So now we need to figure out which portion of that is going to go on the bottom of this fraction. So you can think about this as being our fraction we were talking on the previous slide. So the way that we know which part of this equality will go on the bottom is we're going to look at the units. Do you see this is meters here? So the part with meters is going to go down on this bottom right. So a thousand meters will go on the bottom. The reason for this is we need our units to cancel out. 
So meters is going to cancel out meters that way, okay? Our units are always going to cancel down and to the right. So if I have meters right here, then I have to have meters right there, always. That is one of the important rules of dimensional analysis. Okay, so if I put this part on the bottom, then this part has to go on the top, okay? So now we've set this all up. We've converted meters into kilometers, right? Whenever the unit here, right, in this top right matches what we're trying to find, that's how we know that we're done. We were trying to find kilometers, we found kilometers, we're done. We're done setting up our math. Okay, so now we double check, we make sure all of our units cancel, we're only left with the unit that we're looking for, and then it's time to do math. The way that we do math with this is we're going to multiply all of the numbers on the top and divide by all of the numbers on the bottom. So this would look like 400 times one, right? Because we're doing, we're multiplying the numbers on the top and then divided by the number on the bottom. Okay, so always in dimensional analysis, we're multiplying the numbers on the top, dividing by the numbers on the bottom, and then that will get us our answer. Okay, make sure your answer always has a number and a unit. That's very important in chemistry. Okay, remember we talked about before, if we don't have a unit, that number doesn't really mean anything. 0.4 what? 0.4 seconds, 0.4 liters, right? We don't know, so you always have to have a number and a unit. Um, and there, under it, sorry, I read, I wrote of it, over it, um, but units are essentially treated like numbers and they can cancel out, right? So that's what we're doing there, okay? Our conversion factor that we're using here has to have the original unit that we were starting with, so it needed to have meters, and leave behind only the new one, right? Kilometers, that's what we were trying to find. The original unit needs to be in the denominator, right? So meters has to cancel meters. That's the part that needs to go on the bottom. And the new unit has to be up here in the numerator in order to be left over. Okay, so these are just our rules that we were kind of talking about as we went through this process. Alrighty, let's go ahead and do some practice problems. So our first one is to convert 215 centimeters to meters. All right, so our first thing that we always need to do is figure out what we're starting with. Here, we're starting with 215 centimeters and we're trying to convert it to meters. So again, we're starting with centimeters, we're trying to finish with meters, right? So we're going from our known quantity to our desired quantity. Our equality that we're going to use is 100 centimeters equals one meter. So again, you see this has centimeters and meters in it. So this will allow us to do that conversion. So we put what we're starting with in the beginning of our train track. Okay, so there's our 215 centimeters. And again, like I said, leave that part on the bottom blank. So now we're going to use this equality and we're gonna plug it into our train track so that the units cancel correctly. Since we have centimeters here, then we need to have centimeters down here because remember, our units will always cancel down and to the right. So our 100 centimeters will go on the bottom and that will allow our units to cancel. And remember, when things are equal, they get stacked. So if we put 100 centimeters on the bottom, that means one meter needs to go on the top. So that's where that is. So then we make sure our units cancel, and then we're left only with the desired quantity, only with the thing we're trying to find. So now, now that we have meters, and that's what we were looking for, we can go ahead and do math. Remember, all of the numbers on the top will get multiplied, and they will get divided by the numbers on the bottom. So this will be 215, times one divided by 100, okay? And that will get us our answer. Remember, number and the unit. Your unit here is always going to be the unit that we end with right there. Okay, let's go ahead and try another one. Convert 25 kilometers to meters. So again, we need to go kilometers to meters and our equality that we know is one kilometer is equal to 1,000 meters. Okay, so you hopefully are seeing by now that it's really important to know these conversions. And the way that we know the conversions is by using the prefix. Centi means 100, right? And kilo means 1,000. So that's how we're getting these equalities. These, will things, these are things you will be expected to know on the quizzes and tests. I will not give you the meanings of the prefixes and I won't give you these equalities. You'll need to be able to come up with them on your own. 
All right, so we're starting with 25 kilometers, so that will go in the beginning of my train track. Okay, and again, units have to cancel down into the right. So if I have kilometers here, then I need to have kilometers down here. So this portion will go on the bottom to make sure that our units cancel correctly, and that 1,000 meters will go on the top. We make sure our units cancel out and that we're left with what we're trying to find. Then we multiply the numbers on the top and divide by the numbers on the bottom, and we get our answer. All right, I want you to go ahead and pause here and give this one a try. How many millimeters are in 3.42 meters? So you probably don't have those uh, prefixes memorized yet, so go ahead and use you know that table that shows all of the conversion factors for now. But do make yourself a note that you'll need to learn them very soon in order to be able to keep going. All right, go ahead and pause here, try this out, and then we'll keep going. Alrighty, so here's our plan. We need to go from meters to millimeters. Remember, this is what we're starting with. Whatever we have the number and the unit, that's what we're starting with. So we need to go from meters to millimeters. So our equality that we know is one meter is equal to 1,000 millimeters. So we're gonna start with our number in the beginning of our train track, 3.42 meters, make our train track there. And then remember, meters has to cancel meters. So the one meter will go on the bottom to make sure our units cancel. And that 1,000 millimeters will go on the top. Multiply the top and divide the bottom, we'll get our answer. Alrighty. So not everything just has one step train tracks like we've been doing, right? Thus far, we've just used kind of one conversion factor to get our answer, but some of them require more conversion factors, like we'll convert to one unit and then to another unit before we get our final answer. So we'll have a series of conversions. So like this one, if we were to convert one day into seconds, right? We may not know how many seconds there are in one day off the top of our head, right? That may not be something you, you're just wondering around knowing. Maybe you do, but maybe you don't. Um, but we do know how many hours there are in a day, right? We know there's 24 hours in a day. We know there's 60 minutes in an hour, and we know that there's 60 seconds in a minute. So knowing all of those conversion factors, right, all of those equalities, we can put together a dimensional analysis problem and allow us to convert from days into seconds. So even though we don't know that answer, we can find it out with conversions that we know. So here's everything we know. One day is 24 hours, one hour is 60 minutes, and one minute is 60 seconds. So like usual, we put what we're starting with at the beginning of our train track. So one day, and we'll make our train track there. So we know that day has to cancel day, right? The only one that uses one day is this one. So our one day will go at the bottom and 24 hours will go at the top. Okay, so now we've used that conversion factor. So we've converted days into hours, but we're trying to find seconds. So we're not done yet, right? The, the way that we'll know that we're done is when this unit matches what we're trying to find. Since this has hours and this has seconds, we're not done yet. So we'll keep going. So now we can use this conversion factor. We know that there is 60 minutes in one hour. So again, hour has to cancel hour, so that one hour will go on the bottom and 60 minutes will go on the top, okay? So now we've you know converted hours into minutes, but again, it doesn't match the unit that we're trying to find, right? We're trying to find seconds and all we've done is convert to minutes now. So that's how we know we need to keep going. So we'll continue on with our train track and we'll use this conversion factor. Remember, minutes has to cancel minutes, so that one minute will go on the bottom and 60 seconds will go on the top. Make sure our units cancel that we're doing it right. And now we know that we're done because seconds matches seconds, right? When the unit in the top right matches what you're trying to find, that's how we know our train track is complete. So now we go through and we multiply all of the numbers on the top and we would divide all of the numbers on the bottom, except they're all one, so that doesn't really matter. Um, but we'll multiply all the numbers on the top, divide by all the numbers on the bottom, and we'll get our answer. Okay, so we can do the same dimensional analysis process with more conversion factors. We just kind of add on more train tracks until we get to the unit that we're looking for. All right, let's try a metric to English conversion. We are going to do these the exact same way, 
The only difference is that these aren't conversions that you will need to have memorized. Like I said, anytime we're going from metric system to English system, I will always give you those conversions. You'll still need to be able to do the train tracks and actually kind of math this out, but you don't need to memorize the conversions. So like here, when this says how many feet are in 250 centimeters, I would give you this conversion from centimeters to inches. Likely, you already know that there are 12 inches in one foot. If you don't, it's a handy conversion to know, not just in this class, but just kind of in your life. I think that would be useful. Um, but I will give you things like centimeters to inches because that's a conversion you're likely not familiar with. So here's our equality. One inch is 2.54 centimeters. So like I said, that's the one that will get us from metric to English and vice versa. Um, and this is an English system conversion. One foot is 12 inches. Uh, like I said, likely you know this one already. If you came across it on a test and you don't know it, I will give you that one though, because the English system is not a focus of this class. All right, so here again, we need to figure out what are we starting with? 250 centimeters, that's our number in our unit. That will go in the beginning of our train track. Again, leave that bottom square blank um, and we're gonna start making our train track. So we have centimeters here and so we need to have centimeters down there. So we know that there are 2.54 centimeters in one inch. So the centimeter portion, that will go on the bottom because centimeters has to cancel centimeters. And then one inch will go on the top. Again, make sure our units cancel so that we know that we're doing it right. Um, and then we will notice that we're not done yet, right? This is inches, we're trying to find feet. So we have to keep going. So we continue on with our train track and inches has to cancel inches down here. So that 12 inches will go on the bottom and that one foot will go on the top. We make sure our units cancel and then we can see, okay, we're trying to find feet and we got to feet. So we're done, right? We're done making our train track. But always remember, you have to actually go through and calculate it as well. Every once in a while, I come across people who will set the whole thing up and they forget to actually plug the numbers into their calculator. So don't let that be you. Make sure you're plugging this in. So we're gonna multiply all of the numbers on the top and divide by all the numbers on the bottom, okay? And then we'll get our answer. So I wanna be super clear here because this is the first time we really come across it. I want you right now to go ahead and plug this into your calculator. If you need to pause and go get it, do that. But I want you to plug this into your calculator to make sure that you are getting 8.2 feet. To do this, I know this sounds silly, but you're gonna do 250 times one times one, right? Those are all the numbers on the top divided by 2.54 divided by 12, okay? And that will get you 8.2 feet. Do you see how I put divided? Each time there's something on the bottom. So divided by 2.54 divided by 12, okay? Sometimes people will do, oh, we're divided by 2.54 times 12 because they're both on the bottom. And yes, technically that's true, but you would need to then use parentheses in your calculator. And I have found people make a lot of mistakes when using parentheses in their calculator. So my recommendation is to hit multiply every time there's a number on the top and divided by every time there's a number on the bottom. So 2.5, you know, divided by 2.54 divided by 12. Like I said, I would plug this in right now and make sure you're getting that answer. If you get anything else, know that you're punching in your calculator wrong and go back and double check. All right, let's go forward. So here's another metric to English conversion. Uh, it's your turn. This one says, how many meters are in five yards? So I'm gonna go ahead and give you this, that we need to go yards to feet and then to meters. And here's some helpful equalities that I think you might want. Okay, so go ahead, pause here, try this out, and then come back when you're ready to see the answer. All right, so we are starting this with five yards. So that's what's gonna go in the beginning of our train track. Okay, remember yards needs to cancel yards. So down to the right, that will be where yards goes. So one yard will go down there and three feet will go on the top because remember when things are equal, they're getting stacked in our train tracks. Okay, we make sure yards cancels yards and then we're left with feet, but we're not done because we're left with feet and we were trying to find meters. So we have to keep going. And so we'll use this other conversion, right? There are 3.28 feet in one meter. So again, feet cancel feet, and we are left with meters. 
Alrighty. So thus far, we've just been using length, right? We've been using meters and kilometers and feet and inches, right? But we can do this exact same thing with mass. And honestly, in chemistry, we don't do a lot with length. Like we don't do a lot with meters and centimeters because that's not typically how we measure things. We do measure things in mass though, a lot, right? Uh, we'll go, we'll weigh things out on the balance, right? And we'll record our mass that we get there. The mass is the amount of matter in an object. Okay, and we measure mass on a balance in the back of our classroom, right? Um, mass is actually different than weight. Weight is the effect of gravity on an object. And so weight is measured on a scale, which is measuring force against a spring, and we measure mass a little bit differently. Um, on Earth, for the most part, mass and weight end up kind of being the same thing. But if we were to say on, be on the moon, then mass and weight are different. So make sure that you're using the term mass in this class and not weight, because weight takes into the force, takes into account the effect of gravity, whereas mass does not. Mass is just telling you how much matter you have in an object. So mass is independent of location, which means your mass doesn't change. Whether you're down here, right, we're a little bit below sea level in Visalia, um, or you're you know up at the top of a mountain. Your mass doesn't change, but your weight does. Your weight will actually change based on the effect of gravity on you. So you actually weigh a little bit different than um, up on the top of a mountain than you would do in Visalia, which is kind of interesting, right? Um, so make sure you're using the term mass instead of weight. So mass is the standard uh, measurement in the metric system uh, for weight, well, for amount of stuff, right? Not weight. Um, but that's for the metric system. When we use the SI system, the unit of mass is actually the kilogram. Um, the reason for this is that the gram is actually too small of a unit of mass to be its standard unit. So just so you know, we would measure like your mass, like if you went and stood on a balance, we would measure your mass in kilograms. So you can think of kilograms as kind of being like pounds, right? We would use your mass in kilograms, whereas we would measure the amount of mass in our reaction, right, the amount of stuff we're weighing out, we measure that in grams, which you can kind of think of being more like ounces, right? So grams is much smaller. Um, so it was too small to be the unit of mass for the SI system, but it is the standard system uh, for the metric system. So here's a helpful metric to English conversion. One kilogram is equal to 2.205 pounds. Um, and again, just like with all of the other English to metric conversions, I will give you this one if you need it. You are not required to memorize this. Um, I will tell you though, if you ever travel internationally, this is really helpful to know how heavy your bag can be before you get on an airplane, just as a heads up. All right, let's go ahead and try this out with our dimensional analysis that we've been talking about already. So this says how many centigrams are in 0 0.12 kilograms. So again, do you see these prefixes? Remember, these prefixes are going to mean the same thing whether we're talking about kilograms or kilometers, right? Because it still has that prefix kilo, it's meaning that there are a thousand grams in a kilogram, just like there were a thousand meters in um, a kilometer. So that prefix is staying the same even though the base unit is changing, okay? So let's try this out. Anytime we have a prefix in both of our units, my recommendation to you is convert it to the base unit, right? So like convert it to grams and then convert it to centigrams. You will see, like if you went and looked this up on the internet, um, you will see there are conversions to go directly from kilograms to centigrams. Um, and you can do that, you can memorize that if you like, um, but it's a lot more things to memorize. And I really try to keep the amount of memorization in this class as low as humanly possible. So I would recommend memorize how to get from kilograms to grams and then grams to centigrams because those are conversion factors you are going to know already when you learn those prefixes. Um, but like I said, you can choose your own adventure. So let's go ahead and try this uh, the way I recommend. So using the prefixes, we will know that one kilogram is equal to 1000 grams. Okay, right? Because remember that prefix kilo means a thousand and one gram is equal to 100 centigrams. Remember centi, we can think about as like cents. So there are 100 centigrams because they're like cents in a gram. All right, so let's set this up. 
So again, we're putting what we're starting with at the beginning of our train track. So that 0 0.12 kilograms goes at the beginning. And we'll go ahead and set this up. Remember, kilograms always cancels kilograms. So our if we have kilograms here, we have to have kilograms down there. So our one kilogram will go on the bottom. And remember, when things are equal, they get stacked. So that 1,000 grams will go on the top. We cancel out our units. And then we check, you know, is this what we're looking for? Right there is grams. We're looking for centigrams. So we're not done yet, and we keep going. So we have another conversion factor to get from grams to centigrams. So now we can use that. Remember, grams has to cancel grams down and to the right, so that one gram will go on the bottom, and the 100 centigrams will go on the top. Make sure our units cancel, and then make sure what we're ending with is actually what we're trying to, oops, what we're trying to find. Okay, so centigrams and centigrams were done. So now we can just go ahead and punch this in our calculator. We'll multiply all of the numbers on the top and divide by all of the numbers on the bottom and get our answer. So it doesn't matter whether we're doing this with length or with mass, this system of conversions always stays the same. All you need to do is find your equalities so that you can plug them into this dimensional analysis process and get your answer. So just like we did with length and mass, we can do the exact same thing with volume. Okay, volume is the amount of space occupied by matter. Okay, so it's a measurement of the amount of space. Our SI unit of volume is the cubic meter. Um, and this is actually really, really large. Um, a cubic meter is more what you would use to measure the size of your room, right? Maybe your bedroom or your kitchen or whatever it is, right? And so you might imagine that's not overly useful in chemistry. That unit is just too big um, for us to be using because we usually do reactions on a much smaller scale. Um, so the metric volume that we're using typically in chemistry is going to be liters. But remember, if you think about like a two liter bottle of soda, that still is really large for chemistry. So typically in chemistry, we actually use milliliters. And that's what we're measuring out when you're using like a graduated cylinder. We're measuring out milliliters. So that's going to be the most common unit of volume in this class. So here are some different laboratory devices that we can use to measure volume. Uh, like I said, the really common one that we use in this class is going to be the graduated cylinder. Uh, most of the time, that's what we're using. If we want to be even more precise, though, we'll use a burette, which is super cool. Uh, we'll actually use this toward the end of the course when we look at acids and bases. It's a very precise way of measuring volumes, even better than a graduated cylinder. We also have some pipettes, which we'll use in this class. And if you're working in the medical field, you may be familiar with syringes. Syringes often measure in either milliliters or you might see cubic centimeters or cc's, right? So milliliters and cubic centimeters and cc's are all the same thing, which is kind of cool. Milliliters is the same as cubic centimeters. It's the same as cc. So when we're talking about milliliters in here, that's the same as saying cc. So far, I'm talking about five milliliters of a solution. That's the same as saying five cc. So that's what you may be seeing in the medical field. Um, this one I skipped over. This is the volumetric flask. Those are for measuring very precise amounts of liquids, um, but they can only measure actually one volume. So this is a 100 milliliter volumetric flask. It can only measure exactly 100 milliliters. It measures 100 milliliters very, very well, but not any other volumes. Um, so it's not going to be really used in this class. You'll typically see the graduated cylinder, a little bit of a burette, and sometimes a pipette. So here's some common volume relationships. So the most common one that we'll use is that one liter is equal to 1,000 milliliters. We'll use that a lot in this class. Um, but what will help you is that milliliters is the same thing as cubic centimeters. So if you have a volume in milliliters, that's the same as the volume in cubic centimeters. That's what this equality is saying here. One milliliter is the same as one cubic centimeter. Kind of cool. Um, and then another one that's useful is one liter is equal to 1.057 quarts. And that will get us from the metric system to the English system and back again. So again, this one is one that I would give you. You don't need to memorize that one. You do need to know these though. So let's try this out. Convert 0 0.345 liters to milliliters. We are going to do this the exact same way that we've been doing all the other dimensional analysis problems. Just now we're using volume instead of mass or distance. 
right? So again, we're gonna put what we start with at the beginning of our train track. Okay, so there's our 0 0.345 liters. Um, and we need to use a conversion factor that'll get us from liters to milliliters. So that's this one. Again, remember this prefix milli means very small. So there are 1,000 milliliters in a liter, um, just like we've been doing, you know, there are 1,000 milligrams in a gram. It doesn't matter what the base unit is, we're just looking at that prefix to help us figure out what numbers go with it. So just like we've been doing before, we'll use our, you know, our units to tell us where things go. So liters has to cancel liters. So one liter will go on the bottom and that 1,000 milliliters will go on the top. We'll multiply all the numbers on the top, divide by the numbers on the bottom, and get our answer. Okay, so this dimensional analysis process has a lot of applications in this class, not even just in unit conversions, but we're going to use it to do even trickier calculations moving forward. So make sure you're getting really familiar with this dimensional analysis process um, so that you can use it when we're doing math in this class. So let's try this one. This one is a little bit tricky, all right? So that's why I'm doing an example of it. This is a combined dimensional analysis practice problem. So this says, what is the volume of a cube in milliliters with sides measuring 13.1 inches each? So essentially, we have a cube. Okay, you'll have to excuse my drawings, but here's our cube. And we're saying that each side is 13.1 milliliters. Or sorry, 13.1 inches. Okay, and I wanna know the volume of this cube in milliliters, okay? So here's our general kind of plan. We need to convert inches to centimeters, right? Because that's a conversion we know, that's an English to metric conversion, and I will give you that. And then we can convert centimeters to centimeters cubed using a volume, right? We can figure out the volume of the cube. Once we get our volume in, or our, all of our sides in centimeters, we can multiply them all together to get the volume of that cube. And then once we know the volume in centimeters cubed, remember, centimeters cubed and milliliters are the same thing. So if I know my volume in centimeters cubed, then I also know my volume in milliliters. So that's kind of the game plan. I'll walk you through it. So our first step, because you know in chemistry, we don't use inches. So we need to convert all of these um, inches into centimeters. So here's our 13.1 inches. We use our conversion factor and we know one inch is equal to 2.54 centimeters. That's one I gave before, but I'll write it down here again. Okay, remember inches has to cancel inches down to the right. So that's how we know that the inches part goes on the bottom and that 2.54 centimeters will go on the top. So once we've got that, now we know that each side is not just 13.1 inches, but it's actually 33.3 centimeters. Okay, so that's much more useful in chemistry than having inches. So now we can figure out the volume of a cube. Hopefully you've learned this sometime in some math class that you've taken, but if not, the volume of a cube is equal to the side cubed. Okay, because in this example, the sides are all exactly the same length or the same distance. So you can also think of it as length times width times height which is essentially what we're doing here, right? We're gonna multiply each one of those sides, but each one of the sides is 33.3 centimeters. So that's what's happening here. When we multiply all of that out, we get our volume in centimeters cubed. And like I told you before, remember centimeters cubed is the same thing as milliliters. So I'm gonna show it here using the conversion factor, but it would be enough for me on a quiz or a test for you to say, okay, this is you know centimeters cubed, so it's the same in milliliters. And you don't really need to show this work that I have here. Okay, so that's kind of a trickier dimensional analysis problem because we needed to convert the sides of our cube from inches into centimeters before we could do math with it, right? Then we could figure out the volume of our cube and convert it to our proper units. All right, let's try another one. This one says, how many centimeters cubed are in a box that measures 2.20 by 4.00 by 6.00 inches, okay? So what you could do, one way of doing this is take each of those inches, convert them to centimeters using that conversion factor we were using before, right? That one inch equals 2.54 centimeters. And then once you convert each one of these inches into centimeters, you could multiply them all together 
and that would give you the volume in centimeters cubed. I'm actually going to show you a different way to do it though because this is actually really useful. We are going to take inches to centimeters cubed kind of directly. I'll show you this. So instead of converting each one of these inches into centimeters and then multiplying them together, I'm going to multiply them together first to show you another way of solving this problem. So let's say we multiplied all of these inches together and we found our volume in inches cubed, okay? Which is kind of weird. We don't talk about things in cubic inches very much, um, but you can, right? If you multiply three inches together, you'll get inches cubed. Okay, so again, we're measuring the volume of our box. Now we're gonna convert inches cubed to centimeters cubed. And you may be thinking, yeah, I don't know the conversion for that, right? And you haven't talked about it so far, so how are we gonna do that? Here's how we set it up. Here's our equality. One inch is equal to 2.54 centimeters. We know that, right? That's one of those English to metric conversions that I told you I'd give you, and that will always be available to you. We can actually use this equality to convert from inches cubed to centimeters cubed. So the way that we do this is we put our inches cubed here and we put our conversion just like that, okay? But do you see this is inches cubed and this is just inches? So really it's only count canceling out one of those three inches that are up there. So the way we get around this is we actually cube this whole thing. So the way that we do that is we have our inches cubed is now canceling inches cubed and it'll be centimeters cubed on the top, okay? So then we can cancel out our units and that will get us centimeters cubed. So now I didn't have to do three different train tracks before multiplying all of my numbers together. I multiplied my numbers together first and then did one train track. Either way, we'll get you the exact same answer. So whichever method sounded better to you, you can go ahead and do it that way. Um, the cool thing about chemistry is a lot of times there's more than one way to get the right answer. So if a different way makes sense to you or you may have learned it differently in high school, um, that's fine too. You can solve it that way. Um, I'm just going to show you um, what I think is the easiest way to solve problems in this class. Um, I do want to tell you, when you plug this into your calculator, this would be 52.8 times 2.54 cubed. So you would push this in as 52.8 times 2.54 cubed. Um, and you might have to actually put 2.54 and then use the caret and the three, depending on the calculator that you have. And then it would be divided by one cubed. Okay, so that cubed not only goes for the units, but it also has to go to the numbers too. So just be careful with that one. Um, but I do think it's a little bit faster to do it this way if this makes sense to you. All right, so that is actually the end of today's lecture. Um, we've covered quite a bit of ground, right? We talked about the metric system and how the metric system is the most common um, units kind of in the world, and it's the units that we use in chemistry because chemistry is an international language, and we need to be able to communicate with people in different countries. Okay, uh, we, so we learned about the metric system and we used, learned those prefixes that go with the base units. I told you to remember King Henry died unusually drinking chocolate milk to help you remember those prefixes that you need to know for this class. Okay, the main focus of today though was actually on learning dimensional analysis, right? This train track method. And like I said, we are going to use these train tracks to solve a lot of different problems in this class. If those train tracks are not making sense to you, please reach out as soon as possible or go get some help through tutoring because you need to understand them in order to be successful in this course. Okay, so get help sooner rather than later to make sure you feel really confident about this stuff moving forward. Um, like always, I have some uh, problems on the chapter four lecture worksheet for you to work on um, to make sure you solidify these concepts in your mind, okay? These uh, conversions aren't so bad once you get used to them, but they do take a little bit of practice if you've never done them before. So make sure to get the practice you need. And as always, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. I'm more than happy to help you. And remember, I like talking about chemistry. So if you're having some trouble setting up your train tracks, or you're having an issue punching things into your calculator, or even if you're struggling to memorize the prefixes, let me know and I will try and help you as best I can. 
Otherwise, keep getting lots and lots of practice on this and make sure you feel really confident before moving forward. I'm here if you need anything. Otherwise, I will talk to you guys next time.